Hi, I'm Anna Hita. Welcome to In The Zone. This is the first podcast in a new series from the Middle East Treaty Organization. Over the course of these podcasts, we want to explore in more detail some of the key issues that emerge any time that states and their diplomats get together to talk about getting weapons of mass destruction out of the region. Hi, I'm Paul. We believe that this goal is possible. Uh, it's a matter of political will, and the people we're going to interview will suggest constructive approaches that improve our chances, how to dodge the obstacles, how to build trust between countries, and how to improve peace and security for people in the region. Today, we're going to be speaking to two of the founders of MATO, and we'll introduce them shortly. But before that, we'd like to let you know where you can find us online. We have a website, www.wmd-free.me. On the website, you can subscribe to our newsletter, donate money, or even volunteer to work with us. We're also on social media, on Twitter at WMDFreeME, and similarly on Facebook and Instagram. You can also find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. We'd love to hear from you on anything that Meto does. Send us your questions and we'll do our best to give you an answer, or at least our point of view. So, without further ado, let's get going. So today we're here with Ahmad Kiai and Sharon Dolev. They're both directors of MATO, the Middle East Treaty Organization. I'm going to start by giving a quick introduction to them both, and then we can get started on our questions. Sharon is a peace and human rights activist with a focus on eradicating nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction from the Middle East. She's also the founder and director of the Israeli Disarmament Movement and, an, and a representative of the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize laureate International Campaign for Abolishing Nuclear Weapons, ICANN. Ahmad works at the intersection of political risk, diplomacy and disarmament. Alongside being one of the directors of the Middle East Treaty Organization, he's also a principal at the international consulting firm IGD Group, where he leads the peace and security sector. So um, with that, I think we can get started and get in, jump into some of the questions. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Anahita. I'm, I'm going to kick off with Sharon. Uh, Sharon set up Meto, and I want to ask you, Sharon, why? Why did you set up Meto in the first place? Well, I, I never meant to set up Meto. I wanted to campaign in Israel. Israel is one of the nine uh, states that possesses nuclear weapons, and while I was campaigning here, talking about the threats of nuclear weapons, the threats of nuclear arms race in the Middle East, which I still think uh, we should should be very much aware of. Um, showing the problem of nuclear weapons and then showing the solution, which is disarmament. Yet, when you look at Israel, unlike the other nuclear armed states, you don't see a nuclear adversary. You see a region that has Israel uh, in kind of in the middle of the Middle East, surrounded by Arab states, uh, which with most we didn't have relations. Now we have a bit more. Um, on the other side, you have Iran. You you look at the threat that um, that Israelis uh, believe they live under, and you realize that to ask Israelis to give up on the nuclear weapons, on the one thing that they believe, and and one one reason they believe it is because there is no discourse in Israel, but. Yet it's a belief that the only reason we still exist is because of our nuclear weapons. You realize that you have to find a regional solution, something that will allow the states in the region to build some kind of trust, some kind of a layer of, of, um, of mutual ver verification, um, something that will build trust and will allow all the states in the zone to sit in the same room and think what is the safest way of getting to a weapon of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East, which in my belief is the only way to get to a nuclear free world, which is the ultimate goal, of course, uh, when we look at nuclear weapons. When it comes to the Middle East itself, we have other goals. We would like to see um, a zone that is not just talking about weapons of mass destruction, but at some point talks about security, human security, and, and hopefully peace. Ahmad, what made you get involved with NATO? Well, as Sharon said, it was uh, quite an accident, and my involvement was quite an accident as well. Um, I started working on finding a peaceful path to the Iranian nuclear file and uh, discussions around that with the international community. And what I found was that if, if you have a, a better idea or an alternative idea to war, and you work hard on it to be able to sell it to the governments and to those decision makers, then you may be able to avert it. And the success 
initial success of the Iranian nuclear deal of 2015 gave me hope that on these type of issues, if we force and if we focus on a diplomatic path, then there may be an option to bring some relief to a region which usually ends up uh, settling their scores through the barrel of the gun. Thanks, Imad. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that many of our listeners will not be aware of is the role that Meta has played over the last uh, number of years uh, in international negotiations, uh, having uh, side events and uh, other negotiations between, uh, between officials uh, at intergovernmental meetings. Uh, and the energy and the vibrancy that Meto brings such that even on the issue of the zone in the Middle East, which so many people are pessimistic about, we seem to pull in crowds of, uh, of officials and give them a sense of optimism and positivity when they leave our meetings. What is it the two of you think that is that is that lies behind this what what is it that drives the 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 energy of meto and 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 how do you both feel about the way you both in particular interact uh in front of these people and get them to actually change their not just their minds but their but their passion and their energy well, I think that the first thing is that we believe in the zone. I mean, most people didn't believe that it's possible. I mean, most of us been to other panels about the Middle East years before we produced our draft treaty. And we heard de delegations and panels discussing the history. What was the history of the zone until this point and why it's impossible? And we came and said, actually, we show you a possibility. We ask you to believe. We understand that the main reason that it hasn't worked until now is because of lack of goodwill and lack of belief. And we produced this draft treaty with, with one thing that was different. All that we did that was different, that we imagined what it will look like if the states in the zone actually wanted to achieve it. That was the whole difference. Once you put it in front of these diplomats, it's very hard for them to keep the same language. Um, we showed possibility. We never claimed that the possibility that we are showing is perfect. Actually, it was so unperfect that it was a great ground for discussions, for people to say, actually, if you just fix that, it might work. And, it, and suddenly the discourse is changing from it's impossible to you need to change that to make it more possible or uh, we, what is achievable. Weapons of mass destruction didn't, you know, one day landed on Earth. People build them, people can unbuild them. I mean, it, it's that simple. And and showing that was, a di was making a difference. The best mm -hmm. part about this is that we're not restricted like how the governments are. Now, you know, almost anywhere in the world, that governments move really slowly. But civil society and us don't have to. And that is why we have the flexibility to be everywhere and nowhere, we have the freedom to speak truth to power and to let them know, especially those that are in the audience, in this case, the governments and diplomats, that, hey, there is a way. Stop saying there isn't. We are providing one avenue. You don't have to take it completely, as Sharon said. But look, you do not have the excuse anymore to say that it's impossible because we just gave you a roadmap or a mapping right here what kind of impacts do you think progress on negotiating the zone could actually have for people the life of people in the region when you look at the people in the middle east one thing is is for sure the governments in the region most of them um don't always think about the benefit of the people that live in the zone, in the states. And I think that it's quite, this is something that you see across the Middle East, as, as you see across the world. The, when, when governments talk about security and the security of the state, usually it doesn't have much to do with the security of the people of the state. It has to do with the state that nobody really understands what the state is. But when still, when you put these states in one room, to discuss security, 
you have to also discuss confidence building measures. You have to discuss how to build trust, how to, how to start talking to each other in a way that reduces tensions and so on. You can't talk about eradicating weapons of mass destruction or disarmament and the vehicles of, um, of delivery and missiles and, and not talk about the safety of the people. And our hope is first when governments stop putting so much money on these weapons and so much money on infrastructure, they'll have more money for other things, maybe health systems, maybe uh, social security systems. So, so you, you can't reduce these weapons without increasing the safety of people. And if they get used to talk to each other about weapons of mass destruction, they might also think about better ways to, to deal with climate change, which is a regional thing. I mean, um, the, these, these issues are not staying in the borders. I don't see how, how governments finally talking to each other and building trust is not something that we can use to the benefit of all people. Imad, uh, following up on that, so what, what would you say is the role uh, of civil society uh, in a region where people assume most of the time that civil society is quite weak and ineffective and where um, in the last uh, few weeks uh, there's been polls suggesting that people think that um, the uh, Arab awakening or Arab spring or whatever it is that we uh, experienced some years back um, has has led unfortunately to uh, to a region that's uh, worse worse off than it was before. It is true that civil society faces uh, a lot of obstacles in the Middle East, especially in a region that is fraught with instability and governments that are more characterized by authoritarianism and dictatorships than with uh, democracies. And that is the truth. And the population has been under a lot of repressive policies by their governments. And yet we see year after year, month after month, that civil society in these countries with so much to lose because they have so little protection of their human rights still put themselves out there to fight for their freedom may that be the freedom of thought movement or economic survival and many may say that the Arab Spring or Arab Awakening of a decade ago did not result in their ultimate liberation. But it, what it did was it gave them one liberty that cannot be taken away anytime soon. And that's their fear of authority. And as an Iranian, I can tell you this straight on that in 1970, Eight, nearing 1979, nobody would have guessed that the biggest purchaser of U.S. weapons then, the Iranian Shah, would topple like a deck of cards when millions of Iranians poured into the streets. So these dictators and authoritarian regimes have their days coming, and they know it well. And what we are saying here is that the WMD free zone in the Middle East, as Sharon has mentioned, will open up the opportunity for these governments, not just discuss these issues, but go broader and discuss the real weapons of mass, you know, destruction that is facing the region. And that's water uh, uh, insecurity, that's food insecurity, that's climate catastrophe that is happening. That is the migration issue, the, the, what is happening to our environments and so forth. That is the ignorance of our minds that has created extremism and, and, and. So let this be a gateway. And that is what we're trying to push. The, the work on the zone is important twice. Once because one of the nuclear armed states is here in the zone, Israel. But the other reason is because in a funny way, the, the other states, uh, other the, the nuclear armed states or the uh, umbrella states have been using the Middle East and the non-progress in the Middle East as a reason for them not to discuss their own weapons. And while working at the Middle East and show some progress, in a way, we're telling them two things. A, get a grip, start working on your own weapons. 
And second, stop using the Middle East, which both are very important messages. Not to use the Middle East is a very important message by itself, because these states also sell lots of weapons into the Middle East. I mean, the Middle East is being used twice here. Once as a place to sell weapons, and as long as there are these turmoils, then, then of course Saudi Arabia would like to buy some F-35s, Israel too, um, and then we need better uh, missiles, and then we need better missile defense. I mean, they're all making so much profit of, out of our work. Violent conflict is not necessary. There have been those who are now best friends who butchered each other in their millions only two generations ago, France and Germany. And they did it twice. Those crazy. And now the buddies. That is the vision and the future I see for the Middle East. Once the mindset changes and the WMD free zone in the Middle East and the, uh, the pathway we have provided as one option forward will allow for those conversations to happen. For the Arabs, Israelis and the Iranians to see that they have much more in common in terms of their challenges, in terms of their culture, their history, even their religion. And how they even look like. I mean, go down the road and try to figure out who's the Israeli, who's the Iranian, who's the Arab. They all look the same to me. So my hope is in this new generation, one that has never been more connected with the rest of the world. And my hope is in the decision makers that are sitting in power to realize that their time is running out. They can decide to bring peace or be gone with their wars. Listen, the world powers are selling their arms and means of war to the most destabilized region in the world. Now, what happens when you throw fuel on fire? The fire gets bigger. So we have to take the oxygen away from this fire. We have to take these weapons out of the system. And for that, it is those governments, and it's a handful of governments, that are buying and purchasing as much as they can from the United States and Russia and France and a few other world powers who collectively sell 85% of each of the Arab Israel countries defense needs. So these weapons are not coming out of thin air either. They're coming from those capitals that are preaching peace. So we need to make sure that these governments of the region realize that these fancy toys will not protect them from the wave of change that is coming. That instead, they should invest in all of those other things that really matter for their populations. That is socioeconomic and political development that they are wanting. And these weapons are just draining their coffers and their budgets. And it's going to get worse when the oil prices collapse further and when climate change forces us to become greener in our applications and our way of life. So the time is ticking. And if we want to invest in our future, the Middle Eastern countries, rich in their own resources, must realize that the most precious resource they have is the human resource in the geographical location that encompasses and connects continents together. And that is what I hope that they will reach and understand. And we hope that the responsibility that world powers will take with, with their populations and the pressure coming from their civil society to stop bringing death to our region, stop bringing these weapons to our region, stop bringing this backing of political support for the carnage that these allies of their, these countries in the region are unleashing on their own people and their neighbors. And this is what we want to achieve. We want to bring that responsibility to the doorstep in Washington, in Paris, in London, in Beijing, and in Moscow. Thank you so much, Imad. I think when you talk about that, it brings to mind all the hope that rests on cooperation and states taking individual responsibility to do their bit. And then it makes me think about personal. Um, it's quite unexpected to see an Israeli and an Iranian not only cooperate with one another, but work so personally with such passion and dedication to this issue. I wonder how you did it. What, how did you guys meet? How did you move forwards and find a constructive kind of way to overcome what most likely would have a lot of people would assume is a lot of hostility? 
to find something constructive to work on this together. I think that both Imad and I already realized that just because you were born in some place doesn't make you automatically an enemy. First and, first and for all, you're just a person. Um, we, we met in the best place to meet, in the UN. And um, I think at the beginning, we were a little bit the Iranian and the Israeli. Um, I mean, for me, I was, I was uh, speaking on a panel. Um, there was an Iranian asking me a question. I thought my answer would surprise him. I think it did. Um, I can't speak for Imad, but I can say that it, it, I think it took us five minutes to get beyond the fact that he's Iranian and I'm Israeli. We were two people looking at the zone. We're two people that have um, some kind of optimism. Um, and, and, and we trust each other which is most important. I mean, you, you don't trust somebody just because he was born in, your, in the same state as yours. You trust somebody because he has a good brain, a good heart. And if he's smart, it's even better. And if he's kind, it's amazing. And if you can build friendship at, at the process, then you also have fun when you work. Um, and, and I think that, um, that, that, was, that was it for me. I mean, two people want the same thing and willing to take some risk in order to get it and to put so many hours with no money to do it. I mean, what can make us closer? No, thank you, Sharon. Um, I mean, the reality is that uh, when, you cut your, uh, when you cut your skin, everybody's blood is red. So that's a good reminder uh, that the fact that we are one uh, human race and in our tribal region, we have so much in common. And I remember uh, meeting Sharon and realizing that I have um, a comrade <laughs> with me. I have a sister with me and a, a, a dedicated human being that seeks peace, justice, and uh, one that sees the vision of this region as being positive and constructive. And I think we are tired of uh, in this um, region being told that this is it. You are doomed forever. You know, when we enter a room, nobody knows who's the Iranian and who's the Israeli. <laughs> At the end of the day, just, we don't right. have to say. Right. We don't have to say. Great, thank you, thank, thank you both. It's 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 always an inspiration, and I've been working with both of you for years, and I still uh, enjoy uh, uh, these interactions. Um, I wonder if uh, if you have any last thoughts for the listener uh, to this podcast. Uh, what's what what's the most important thing you'd like to leave with them, where they might uh, they might reflect, uh, and it might even get them to pay more attention and get involved. Uh, in, in the initiative? Well, before even looking at this initiative, I think that everyone that listens to us um, and feels that they have no power and that if you are just a person, especially when you look at these big weapons, I, you, know, you know, we're just a group of people, no organization behind us. There was no organizations behind us. We were just a group of people that decided to go into the UN, to enter to a room, and and yes, we learned from other organizations how to do it, but we just had a good idea, and we went and we and we pushed it. So so, so just look at yourself as somebody that can, and then when you feel so empowered, get into our website and join. We need your help. <laughs> join us on our newsletter. Donate if you got money. And if you've got a good skill, sign up to volunteer or even intern with us. And not just that. The website also provides you a gateway to some resources and to better understand this issue. And I hope that you educate yourself on this topic. And in doing so, you also get the bug to believe in what we see in the vision we have. Great. Thanks. Thank you, well, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for participating.
Thank you so much, Ahmad and Sharon, not just for speaking, but also doing most of the promo work for us on the get-go. So as everybody listening now knows, we've got our website up and running. And um, we also have a Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. They're all under the URL WMD Free M E. Um, I urge you to like, follow, subscribe, and share all of our posts. That they, they, they will be quite entertaining to everyone listening. I hope you've enjoyed um, our first episode with Mato, and uh, you tune in for the upcoming episodes. We've got a lot in store. So thank you so much. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Ahmad and Sharon. Thank you, Anahita.